lives forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns forevermore. And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for being with us on this Sunday morning. I taped the program earlier, so I am in Oklahoma City this Sunday morning with the Southwest Church of Christ. We're talking about closing the back door. We're talking about how to keep people from leaving or going after those who have left the church. We'll talk about that sometimes. That's a very interesting subject. And I'll be preaching today and uh, getting, Lord willing, get on a plane and come back uh, this afternoon and be back at home. And uh, I want you to pray for these efforts. I enjoy this very much, trying to help churches grow, trying to help churches get back on track. A lot of churches of Christ have declined, or they plateaued, or declining. But there's some that are growing, too, just like in other religious groups. But I want to remind you again, and thank you for your response to our request last week. We talked about what happened in, in North Carolina recently with the flood, Florence. Uh, of course, it was on the uh, news just day and night there for a while, but now it's all over as far as the coverage is concerned, but now we can go in and Mayfair is taking up special contributions and uh, we'll be sending a team up uh, to the New Bern area, uh, North Carolina, that uh, 4,300 homes were destroyed and damaged and also in, uh, in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina. So. We'll be uh, working out of those congregations, and we'll also be contributing to the Church of Christ Disaster Response Team. This is a work out of Nashville, Tennessee. They have uh, vehicles that go in, and they are able to feed people. They're able to provide. What we provide now is money, and the team will be going shortly, and they will be helping them. And I want to show you again some of the responses. There are the vehicles that are used to pull into the area and help them with a hot meal and uh, pay for some housing and for some food until these people can get back into their homes. Look at these pictures of the flooded area. It's hard to imagine uh, just getting in a boat and just, you know, just leaving. There's one of our, our church buildings that was just completely destroyed. Now, what happens, we go in, and after the water recedes, we have to tear out everything. You know, you saw what happened in Houston, and this is very similar. So there is an example of what the, the people are facing. They're, not, uh, they're just beginning to be allowed to go back into their homes and back into the area, and that's when we can help. We have a group of people that go in, and they call mudding the house. They uh, scrape everything down and wash everything down and tear everything out and then try to put it back together. We have a hammerheads uh, group of men and women that are extremely uh, skilled in doing things rapidly and very effectively. And so this is uh, what I don't want us to forget. Uh, Sometimes when the TV cameras go home, uh, we forget about what people have to deal with. And so not only see is their home destroyed, but their place of business, uh, no doubt, has been affected. And so we're taking up special contributions, and uh, I'll let you know when it all comes in. And if you have some you would like to share, send it to Mayfair and stub it, the disaster relief, uh, the Florence uh, flood, whatever you want to identify it, and we'll make sure that it gets to the place it needs to. 
to be to do the most good. You know, I really do appreciate the confidence. Uh, we got a call right after the flood and uh, somebody sent in a very sizable check and had a note on it. It says, I know you're going to do something, so here's a little bit to help. Now that just, uh, that to me just says it all. And I do appreciate that person having that kind of confidence in us and knowing that we're going to, we're going to help. We're going to help. And we're going to help the uh, Church of Christ disaster relief team uh, help them to provide food to feed these people. And uh, many of them are being fed in the church buildings that are left. Now, I pointed out last week that this for us is a little different than it is than it was in Houston because in Houston we had a number of large congregations, I mean hundreds and hundreds of members. But in North Carolina we don't have that many members, that many congregations. And so even those congregations are, are not, I pulled it up on the internet and some of them have 10 members, some have 20, some have 50. And um, so they're really not able to help themselves, maybe like Houston and the Texas churches. So let's hear from Alabama. <clears throat> let's hear from us in, in the Tennessee Valley. So if you can send in a check and send it to Mayfair and stub it, the uh, flood relief, the um, Florence flood, or however you choose to stub your check. But we will make sure that money gets to the place it needs to be. So thank you so much. You're always so extremely generous. But let's, let's not only provide this uh, physical needs, but let's be praying for them as well because they're going, they certainly need it. This can go on and on. This is not going to be over next week next month. It's not going to be over for a long time. So let's make sure we can do what we can to make things a little bit easier. I can't think of anything. A fire and a flood is just out of control. It's just uh, something you just have to sit there and watch. You know, and the, the, the uh, fires we've seen in California. And, you know, it's coming and there's nothing you can do about it but run. And so the same is true with the water. The water's coming up. And uh, we need to be helpful at this particular time. Now get your Bible, and we're going to talk about this journey that we're taking through the Bible. We're talking about each book in the New Testament. And the thing that will help you in this study is for you to enroll in our World Bible School. And this will help you because you'll understand who was doing the writing, to whom was he writing, and for what reason. And when you understand that, that helps you. So uh, call the number or go online and enroll in our World Bible School. We have about or 80 or 90 people that are involved in grading your material. We have a room that's set aside for World Bible School. And we send these lessons all over the world. We found out the other day, we didn't even know it, that in the last year, 333 people had been converted in Cuba through World Bible School. We had no idea because the mail is so, this is done by the preachers in Cuba. And so we had no idea. They take the World Bible School material and study with these people, and then they want to become children of God. They want to be baptized into Christ and let the Lord add them to the church, Acts 2.47. And so we're taking a journey through the Bible. We got in Ephesians, and uh, I talked about, I mean, the book of Galatians, because uh, it, it's, uh, it's a capsule of the book of Romans. Now, the book of Romans is 16 chapters. This book is six chapters. But it kind of needs to be studied together, because number one, he's talking about Paul's apostleship, he said, the Lord appeared unto me as a child untimely born, that I have a right to be a child of God. As we talked about last week, in the first chapter of Galatians, he gives the most severe warning in the Bible. He said, though we are an angel from heaven, that gets everybody, <laughs> though we humans are even angels, should preach a different gospel other than that which you obeyed, let him be accursed, eternally lost. The, brethren, that's a severe warning. And you and I need to look at our lives and see, are we doing anything that's not substantiated by the Word of God? 
Are we doing anything in our lives? Are we doing anything in our churches that cannot be supported by the, by the Scriptures? Then we need to back up and get back to the Word of God. That's what the Restoration Movement was all about. It was the fact that these men had studied their Bibles and they said, in this country primarily, uh, we brought our division with us. We brought our confused. People don't know what to do because one preacher says one thing, another preacher says something else. And so they need to, you know, we need to get people to get back to the Word of God and see what it says for us to do. The book of Acts, the book of conversion, I've told you before, was written on a sixth grade level. And so anybody passing the sixth grade can read the book of Acts. I guess I need to lower that because they're reading at an earlier age now. And so that's the reason it's so important that Abundant Living for 38 years now has been about one thing, and that is God's Word. God has spoken to us through His Word. And the book of Galatians is one of the best books to talk about, number one, the freedom that we have in Christ. And the verses that I mentioned last time when our time ran out, we were in chapter 2 when Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. Isn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful for somebody to say that about you? That that person is living as closely like the Lord as anybody I know. Wow, what a compliment. Uh, is it possible to be perfect? Of course not. But what effort are, what are we intentional about living a life of God? We'll talk about the Christian graces. I'm going to hurry and get to those in just a few moments. There's another part of that verse. The, uh, for righteousness could be gained, uh, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. In other words, the law just informed us about thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not do those, have any other gods before me. Like uh, John 1, 17, the law came by Moses. That was a law. Don't step across the line. That's the law. But grace and truth through Jesus Christ. And so that's the reason he's saying that the law just made us aware of the right and the wrong, but Christ came and told us why we need to live like that. And he talked about grace and truth, the full truth. And we'll notice that in just a few moments. I'm going to skip over uh, the most part of chapter 3, and I want, to, I want you to look at verse 26 with me. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You what? You are, right now, you are sons of God. Now, I think one of the problems that we've struggled with over the years is saying, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I'll have to wait till I get to heaven. Well, now, wait a minute. That's not what he says here. He says, you are, that's present tense, you are sons of God. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. See, the word faith here is used in the sense of this is the way you live your life. This is the reason you do everything you do. This is the reason you sing, you pray, you read your Bible. This is the reason you live the way you do. You do it by faith. You do it by trusting in God that this is the right thing to do. And so he says, you are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So he goes from the present tense to the past tense. He says, you are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ. I like the NIV here, but he says you have been clothed. One version, the other, the American Standard Version says you have uh, put on Christ, which is the same thing. You put on your coat. You put on your overcoat. You put on your clothing, and you wear this clothing. And he says that's what you do when you become a Christian. 
when you're baptized into Christ, that puts you in that covenant relationship with God and you wear Him, you wear Christ. Well, I, we talked before time went out last time about wearing Him on Sunday only and not wearing Him through the week. I know that the things are different. I know Sunday's a, a religious holiday. I know you don't have to, normally you don't have to work on Sunday, but Sunday is the Lord's day. And there are things we do on Sunday we don't do at other days. Other days we go about our business of making a living or doing the, looking for opportunities like in the book of Galatians, Galatians 6.10, as ye have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. That's what we're doing about North Carolina. What are we doing? We're doing good to all men. We're trying to feed people. We're trying to clothe people. Those people got in the boat and left and came back to nothing. And so Galatians, it's interesting that that verse, Galatians 6.10, as you have opportunity, we do now, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. He's talking about there, the Christians. Make sure you take care of the Christians. And that's part of being in the family of God. And so then this is a wonderful passage uh, to encourage us to realize that we are children of God right now because of what we've done. We're neither Jew nor Greek. We're neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Wow, that is an outstanding passage to tell us who we are. And that's part of our problem. That's the reason it's so easy for us to fall into the clutches of the devil. And that is when we forget who we are. That the Lord has breathed into our nostrils a breath of life. And we have become a living soul, not body, soul. This body is going to decay and go back to the dust from whence it came. And our soul, hopefully, will go to the, back to the Lord who gave it to us. There's one other passage. Uh, this is, let's go to chapter 4, because I have said that in verse 4 of chapter 4, we have one of the most interesting verses in the Bible, because it says, But when the fullness of time had come. In other words, if I could say it in our language, when God's plan was fully revealed, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a virgin, born under the law. Now this takes in the whole Bible. This takes in, because this is a fullness of time. You begin with the book of Genesis. You begin with God and Adam and Eve. And then you move through the Old Testament. You have 2,500 years of the uh, patriarchal dispensation. Patriarch means father. And so who was in charge for 2,500 years? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all of those men that lived before Moses. And so you have fathers who are in charge of the family spiritually. God, who in its under times and divers manners, spake unto the fathers by the prophets, Hebrews 1, but hath in these last days, that's now, he spoken unto us through his Son. So you see, the, you see how it works here? For 2,500 years, the Father was in charge. One day was no more important than the other days. And then in Exodus 19, we have the Ten Commandments. Now God selects Israel. Now then the Sabbath day. Now then the old law. Now you have the priests, the Levites become the preachers, not the daddies anymore. In the sense that the Levites were the preachers of the 12 tribes. And so for 1,500 years you had the, uh, the uh, dispensation of the Mosaical dispensation. And it lasted until the death of Christ. When Christ died, the book of Colossians tells us that, that the old law had been nailed to the cross. And Christ comes preaching the kingdom of God. 
Christ comes in Mark 9 and 1, there are some of you standing here that shall not taste of death until you see the kingdom come with power. And so now you hear a new gospel. Your sins are washed away. They're not just rolled forward. You worship on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and 20, uh, Acts 20 and 7, and on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. And so we have this, when the fullness of time, when God's plan was unveiled according to plan, it was no surprises. A virgin shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, Matthew 1, 21. And so Christ was born by a virgin. The virgin birth is one of the cardinal doctrines of Christianity. There are a lot of modernists, there are a lot of unbelievers that just cannot comprehend the fact that here is a young Jewish woman that brought forth a son without the assistance of a man a virgin birth. And so he was born of a virgin. And when the fullness of time had come, born under the law, God sent forth his son. And so that's what he's trying to get the, the people of Galatia to see, that this is one of the most meaningful verses. Then he goes on to say, um, I'm born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons, because you are sons. Sent God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, and the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, or Father, Father. Since you are no longer a slave, but a son, since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. That Those are just unbelievable promises, and it's all under the heading of uh, sons of God. He tells of what uh, he said, <clears throat> that you are sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now you're in Christ, and neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, the ground is level at the cross. Uh, there's no big me, little you. There's no important person or unimportant. Read the book of James chapter 2, and he talks about being prejudiced. But we're all one in Christ Jesus. That's what thrills me about mission work. That's what thrills me about going to Cuba or going to Baja or going to any place other than the United States in, uh, to people of a different culture, of a different color, of a different background. But we're one in Christ and that bond is so very, very strong. Verse 16, and I'm sure this will kind of take us uh, to the end of our lesson. Paul says here, and I have felt like this for many years, and I wanted to point it out this morning. He says, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Isn't that an interesting passage? Uh, are you mad at me? because I tell you what the Bible says. He's, this is what he's saying. Uh, he has said some very severe things. He has told them not to add to nor take from, that he nor an angel from heaven had the right to preach any other gospel other than that which we preached unto you. And then he, he's talked about uh, that for me to live is Christ. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. Do you want to know the truth? Some people do and some people don't. It's kind of like, I think it's in the book of John when Jesus asked a crippled fellow, do you want to get well? And, and I don't mean this sarcastically. You would, you would think that everybody would, or anybody would say, why sure I want to get well. Really? If you get well, you've got to work. If you get if you get well, you you've got to be responsible. If you get well, you've got to take uh, and do certain things. Do you really want to get well? And so I've asked that question many times over the years because it would appear that some spiritually now, do you want to get well? Do you want to 
change friends? Do you want to change your environment? Do you want to deal with your problem? The book of Hebrews talks about laying aside the sin which doth so easily beset you. Now, I think primarily the, mean, the meaning of that verse there is the, meaning, is the sin of unbelief. But secondly, I think there's also a weakness in all of us that we're most vulnerable to. That there are certain things that you need to watch out for. That there are certain things that you will give in to uh, more easily than, any, than anything else. And that's what he's talking about here. That's the reason Paul, in Galatians, we talked about it last week, Paul went to uh, Peter and he said, you were dead wrong. You, you are being a segregationist. You are fraternizing with one until the Jew or the Gentiles until the Jews come to town, and then you don't know the Gentiles. He said, you're wrong, and I withstood you to your face. Now then, we've said kind of... Not jokingly, but, you know, I'm just the mailman. I didn't write the letters. Don't get mad at the mailman. And uh, I'm just trying to live up to my mail. And I hope you're trying to live up to your mail as well. <laughs> and so the book of Galatians is about Paul's apostleship, about uh, not adding to or taking from the Word of God. And then we'll close right here because... Uh, our time is just about up, but we'll pick up, Lord willing, next week. If it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. If Christ has come to make you free, set you free, why do you go back into slavery? If, if you've been in the mud... <laughs> and you come out and you've been washed and you've been cleansed and you've been sanctified and justified, why go back into the mud? Peter said it a lot more forcefully than this. Peter says it's like, you, like a pig that's been washed and before you know it, the pig has gone right back into the hog pen. And then he says something that's kind of hard to take. He says, or does a dog return to its own vomit? Of course not. And so he says, why would you, because you've been cleansed, because you've been saved, because you've been set free, can you imagine somebody that's been incarcerated, somebody that's been maybe like a prisoner, a war or something like that, and we say, okay, the soldiers are here to liberate you, and you say, no, I want to stay in prison. Why would anybody want to do that? Uh, that's what Paul is saying here in Galatians. And so our time is gone, but I want you to stay with me because I want to finish Galatians, and then we'll get into Ephesians. But I'm enjoying this walk through the Bible. I don't think I've ever done this before with you on Abundant Living, and I hope you're reading with me. That's what I got from these, article, these comments that you've made when you called in. Let's study the Bible. Let's show me how to study. Tell me what it means. And let, in closing, let me suggest this. You've got to have a time. You've got to have a place. And you've got to have a method. And so our time is 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Our method is we're walking through the Bible. And then we're looking at the message. Thank you for watching. Remember those who are in need in the North Carolina area. Until next week, may the Lord bless you is my prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ. A place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is. Come, blessed be the Lord God.